What if vampires were real? We know what you're probably thinking. Vampires? Real? Are Unveiled feeling okay? Well, we're feeling fine and bear with us here because vampires already are real. Well, sort of. Out pops the vampire, Count Davila of Cliftonvania. First off, here's the history lesson. The real life origin stories behind some of today's most popular beliefs about vampires are often just as interesting as the books, films and TV shows which feature the infamous bloodsuckers. We all know about Bram Stoker's Dracula, Murnau's Nosferatu and Charlene Harris's more contemporary hypersexual libertine vamps, but the real ground zero of vampire lore lies with topics infinitely more frightening than any fantasy tale death, disease, and deficient sanitary conditions. These were all huge problems for anyone living prior to the development of modern medicine, particularly for poorer people. As a result, vampire myths and superstitions were created in an attempt to process and deal with shortened life expectancies and unexpected death. Among the diseases initially linked to vampirism was porphyria, a light-sensitive condition which causes the sufferer severe rashes and pain when exposed to the sun. Meanwhile, tuberculosis was a highly infectious killer which often wasted away entire families, leading many villagers to wonder if they'd been cursed by some kind of diseased corpse from beyond the grave. Today, modern medicine and science ensures us that the stories of old are merely entertaining folktales. But let's imagine they weren't. What would the world be like if vampires were real? Fangs out, crucifix is ready. <coughs> For starters, exactly what kind of vampires are we talking about? Let's skip the Hollywood horror brands of mindless, bestial bloodsuckers that seemingly exist only to feed on and frighten helpless victims. The vampires populating today's thought experiments are relatively human-like, can easily communicate, and they generally make their intentions and existence known to us for better or worse. It's their last moment alive, so why not make it a nice experience? The first thing that changes, and it's a big one, are the laws of life and death. If being undead is actually a thing, then what constitutes to being actually dead? If a human is turned, should we mourn? It's all rooted in another big question. Can humans and vampires coexist, as in the HBO series True Blood? Since blood is the vampire's vital food source, humanity's place on the food chain would be instantly threatened. So, some crucial conversation would need to happen to decide whether or not vampires can legally feed on humans, or whether they should find some other blood source to satiate their intrinsic need. Otherwise, it becomes an us versus them situation, which could quite easily transform into a drawn out bloodlust apocalypse, with cross species prejudice, fighting, and slaying at every corner. But even if humans and vamps have formed some kind of truce or understanding, we'd still need laws to impose rules and guidelines for undead conduct among the living. How many people have you told you a vampire? Not many. In the event that vampires curb their feeding habits enough to live alongside us, could they then campaign for wider reaching social inclusion? Should they abide to human laws? Or should humans adapt to vampire rules? And would they take offense to how they've been portrayed in the past as murdering monsters? One especially important legal aspect would be vampire consent laws. They'd likely emerge a section of human society who wouldn't mind either being fully turned or letting a vampire feed on them permanently or on a case-by-case -case basis. A one-night vampire stand, if you will. Can I? Just a peak love. We'd then need laws to protect the unwilling and the underaged against any of the undead who might seek to cross or blur boundaries within our human vampire world. And what about vamps who were turned as children? They might forever look childlike despite actually being 87, but are they adults? Regardless, from the moment of human vampire coexistence, we'd likely need laws to prevent the biting of anyone under the age of 18. In a stricter world, it'd probably be illegal for vampires to even associate with children or even the general public. But could that be considered as discriminatory? 
And would legislation vary state to state, country to country? You got to kill some perverts. Yeah, we're meaning a pedophile. Cool. On the other side, vampire safety would also be top of the agenda. Sure, the idea of being immortal seems great on the surface, but if every vampire's healing abilities differ even slightly, we'd have to overhaul the entire healthcare system in order to treat vampires who have sustained severe or deadly wounds, but are unable to actually die. Peter, do you have a cold? A cold, yeah. There'd also be an eternal need for vampire psychologists specializing in undead mental health and emotional well-being. The police force would need to be specifically trained too in how to interact with and treat vampire victims and or criminals. And if there are unruly vampire types, then Vampire Hunter could finally be a viable job title for some boys and girls in blue. Then there's the question of who fills these jobs. Vampires, humans, or both? Being immortal, vampires could feasibly build much more impressive careers than a human could ever muster. Although the whole only out at night and addicted to blood credentials could somewhat ruin a resume. Another major health issue in a vampire positive society would be the red stuff, blood. Drink and learn. And specifically, keeping enough on hand to feed the vampire populace so that hunting and violence against humans would be unnecessary. If vampires are at risk from the same sort of blood-borne pathogens and diseases that humans are, the unprecedented increase in blood distribution could actually accelerate research and technology to fight illness. At the very least, a vampire presence would require significant global increases in the amount of blood banks. Although exactly how that blood is used, for humans or vampires, could become a major point of conflict. <laughs> Finally, and despite all efforts towards peaceful cohabitation, we humans would surely need a backup plan. Because what if living side by side with fanged creatures of the night just doesn't work out? We'd have to face the very real possibility that evolution had dealt us its reckoning via a slow invasion of vampires into our everyday lives. Our species could be quite easily quashed by a vampire kind who refused to be contained by any laws or guidelines for their behavior, especially as the vampire to human ratio would continually increase. If vampires refused to play ball, what could we ever really do about it? Given their capacity for killing, maiming, immortality, and ruthless recruitment, they'd inevitably overrun us. Have a nice day now. Yet, vampires do already walk among us all the time. As we assured you at the start, vampires are real. And no, we're not simply referring to infamous serial killers like Richard Chase, the vampire of Sacramento, who cannibalized and drank the blood of his victims. There are actually thousands of people across the United States and other countries who choose to live a vampiric lifestyle and claim to have experienced an awakening which drives them to feed. Anton LaVey, founder of the Church of Satan, wrote in his Satanic Bible about psychic vampires, or those who feed upon the energy or life force of others. For LaVey, Psyvamps sought to hinder the enthusiasm or motivation of practicing Satanists. But there are people today who claim to feed upon a similar psychic energy, despite there being zero inkling of scientific evidence that it works. Meanwhile, sanguinary or sang vampires are modern bloodsuckers who do just that, feed on real life fresh from the vein blood. Naturally, it's a much more complex and potentially dangerous process involving the very real threat of acquiring disease. Not to mention the constant need to somehow get your hands on someone else's blood. As such, the donor vampire relationship is based on trust whether between two consenting adults or a couple in a long-term, monogamous relationship. Some Sang vampires even claim that a long stretch between feedings can result in unwanted physical responses, including headaches and sickness. So there you have it, certain vampires do already walk among us. They may not shapeshift, sleep in a coffin, or look like Sir Christopher Lee, but their secretive existence does offer a shadowy reflection of humanity's darker side. As for the all-encompassing, ultra-glamorous Edward Cullen vampire types, if they lived alongside us, we'd have a hellish human rights conundrum to try and solve, and a never-ending need for happy, healthy blood donors. 
Either that, or everyone would wind up learning the subtle science of growing garlic pronto. Ah!